Hello everybody, my name is Mark van Stippout. I work in the cabinet of Commissioner Gunther Oettinger, who is the commissioner responsible for energy in the European Commission. And I'm here uh, today to talk to you about gas infrastructure and in particular investment in new gas infrastructure. How is it organized on the European level? What is the EU doing? And what are the EU rules? First, let me start with the basics. A few principles that may be very common to you, but uh, that I would like to repeat just to uh, put down what we are uh, talking about and what is at stake when we talk about the internal energy market and in particular the internal gas market. First of all, infrastructure is a natural monopoly. It is a monopoly activity. It's not efficient to build a new line for every new supply. So uh, that has to be regulated to make sure that there are no monopoly rents. Uh, that means that the tariffs for using the infrastructure has to be cost-based and that you have to have non-discriminatory access to that infrastructure. Um, that requires, in terms of rules, a TSO, so a transmission system operator, that is independent, um, and a regulator that overviews the activities of the TSO and that sets the tariffs for the use of the infrastructure. The regulator also uh, overviews that the access to the infrastructure is done in a non-discriminatory way, so that all parties who want to use the infrastructure can use it on equal terms, and that is done through the so-called third-party access rules. In terms of ways to make sure that the TSO is independent, one of the big principles that you've probably heard of is ownership unbundling, um, meaning that the network operation is fully separated from the supply undertaking. Um, this we have put down in European law, the so-called third package lays down all these principles for the internal gas market, and um, unbundling is one of them. In reality, we have three different options. One is, as I said, the ownership unbundling, so full ownership separation of supply on the one hand, and network operation on the other hand. Uh, then we have two other possibilities which allow for some way of keeping ownership of the assets uh, that are the pipelines or the cables if we talk about electricity. And that uh, is on the one hand the ISO, the independent system operator, and on the other hand the independent transmission operator, which has all kind of detailed rules to make sure that the TSO operates independently from its mother undertaking, but still allows it to be in one holding, so to say. Next to that, uh, next to operating the existing infrastructure, there is of course a big importance in building new infrastructure, and that means that the tariff setting, the way regulators overview the transmission system operators, also has to give the incentives to the TSO to invest in new infrastructure. Then, of course, a valid question you may have is why is the EU involved in developing European infrastructure? Uh, and if so, how? Um, and there it is relatively simple to start off with. We have a goal to create one European single gas market, single gas and electricity market, or if you like, single energy market. And the European Council, that means all the Prime Minister's Presidents together, have decided that um, we should have one European market by 2014. That means not just competition within countries between the parties active in those countries, but also the free flow of gas across borders and competition across borders so that the markets are no longer national, but that they are regional and European even. Um, of course, historically, uh, gas markets were nationally or even regionally organized by integrated companies who supplied everybody in the territory. That is no longer the case, but it explains why many infrastructure uh, layouts are done purely nationally and there's a lot uh, lack of cross-border interconnection. There was interconnection, there is interconnection to imports for imports of big flows of gas, but there's not necessarily a lot of infrastructure to ensure that com competition takes place on the European level. Competition and security of supply, they are two sides of the same metal. What is good for competition is also good for security of supply. More infrastructure is very important for security of supply because the more diversification, more backup possibilities, more possibilities to import gas mean more security of supply. 
Another um, aspect that will be relevant in my presentation and that I will go into is the difference between regulated and exempted infrastructure. In principle, as I said, uh, the network is a regulated business, but there are uh, possibilities to be exempted from those rules, the ter rules on tariffs and on third-party access, as well as on, on, on unbundling, um, if you have a particular risky new project that uh, will not be built if it's within the regulated system. And that uh, I will go into later, what the conditions are to be exempted for, from the normal uh, rules that the market operates by. Um, as I said before, the TSOs uh, um, have to charge tariffs for the use of the pipe and the regulator, based on setting the rate of return and the regulated asset base, also uh, uh, sets the tariffs or it can set the tariff directly, but usually it does so indirectly by influencing uh, or by looking at what the TSO is allowed to earn over its uh, projects and over its infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, we have third-party access. So we have rules on how to ensure that there is non-discriminatory access to the system. I want in my presentation not only to talk about pipelines, although that will be the main reference, I will also talk a bit about pipeline, uh, sorry, about storage and LNG terminals. And uh, last but not least, um, I would just like to make sure that you bear in mind that when we are talking about pipelines and about infrastructure, we have a large range of stakeholders that are involved. The transmission system operators, those who operate the pipes or the infrastructure, it can be the storage system operator as well, or the LNG system operator. Then we have the national regulators, we have the member states, we have the citizens as consumers, we have companies who are suppliers, and we have European bodies that join up all these interests. So there's a lot of interaction between different players when discussing infrastructure. Good. Um, just to show why it's important that there is a need for uh, European policy on infrastructure. Here you see a map of Europe with uh, different prices in different countries. We make a distinction in this graph between long-term contracts as we have calculated them based on the information available, as well as the prices at the hubs in countries where you have hubs, which is not in all countries at the moment. And you can see that there is a large uh, difference in gas prices over Europe. We're talking about wholesale prices here, we're not talking about prices influenced by taxes, etc. This is purely based on wholesale market supply contracts and it clearly shows that there is no single European market or no gas price. Uh, there is a lot of difference between countries and it uh, depends on the country, the borders, it doesn't necessarily depend on the infrastructure, it doesn't depend on whether you are close to the main supplier or not. Uh, but it just depends on the level of competition uh, in the market and that also depends for, to a large extent on the interconnectedness of one country with the next. Another example I could refer to is the situation in January 2009 when there was a dispute between Russia and the Ukraine over gas supplies and there were no supplies coming uh, through Europe from Russia through the Ukraine which meant that some countries, a lot of countries, were severely affected, but some countries more than other, um, up to 100% of the supply of gas falling away in the middle of the winter, extremely serious situation. That showed to some, or, uh, to some member states that there is a problem with infrastructure, that they are too dependent on one uh, supply route, one source um, of uh, supply, and that we need to diversify. That was particularly the case in Bulgaria, in uh, Slovakia, but also in Poland, Hungary, and uh, the Czech Republic. Romania was different compared to this slide because uh, they have their own production. But when you generally compare the uh, falling away of gas supplies in that period to this uh, figure about the uh, gas prices, you will see that the colors are the same and the colors in terms of um, supply problems in that winter mean also dark red, uh, meaning very cold, uh, that those countries were. So, <clears throat> then um, let me get into the next topic, which is what is the ground for European cooperation for infrastructure. We have um, different uh, things that are going on, uh, that are defined on a European level, uh, in different types of legislation. I put here the main things on the screen that are uh, of key importance. 
Uh, first one is the 10-year network development plan that the TSOs have to develop. Um, through this third package, we set up the European Network of Transmission System Operators, uh, which is joining all the TSOs of Europe together. They have lots of responsibilities also in uh, operating the existing infrastructure, harmonizing the rules so that gas can flow around freely and we use the existing infrastructure better, which is of course very important when we talk about the need for new infrastructure. But they also have to uh, look at the investment plans of the different TSOs and the development of the European gas market through their 10-year network development plans. Uh, then we have um, the recently agreed and still to be officially adopted regulation on trans-European networks for energy, which talks about ways to improve uh, and speed up building of infrastructure in Europe. I will come to more details on that later. But what we have uh, for the first time done there is that also when there are projects that are of key importance for the European Union, they should benefit from fast permit processes. Then, as I said, after the January uh, 2009 uh, gas supply crisis, we have also issued a security of gas supply regulation that on the one hand talks about emergency preparedness uh, and what to do when there is a problem with gas supplies and how to cooperate across borders, but that also addresses investment in new infrastructure that was so clearly identified at that time. And one of the things is physical reverse flows. At the moment, the gas flows from east to west, and normally it should, because the gas is in the east and the demand is in the west. But um, in particular in Eastern Europe, if there is a problem, they have no backup, and the physical reverse flows to supply gas from the west, for example, from uh, the storages in Austria or the supply of Norway to Germany and then further east should be possible in times of emergency, but for that we need also to invest in infrastructure through physical reverse flows. Another important uh, measure that was taken then was uh, investment based on the N-1 criteria, which means that when a country is dependent on one major supply route, it has to be sure that it invests in new pipelines so that it can diversify the sources of gas, even though um, there is maybe no direct additional need for that pipeline because the gas can be supplied from one pipeline. Let's say the demand matches the supply. But uh, in terms of security of supply, when something happens with that main supply route, uh, that is a vulnerable situation that we should avoid. And of course, such new infrastructure is also good for uh, competition. Then, uh, last but not least, I already alluded to this, the discussion about tariffs and uh, tariff setting by regulators. Of course, when we are talking about a European market um, and we have uh, tariff rules in different member states, there is also a need to look at how they correspond across borders. One uh, issue is, for example, when uh, two or three countries on the same pipeline um, uh, need to invest, but only the country at the end of that pipe has a real interest because it needs the supply. Uh, the countries further upstream are also asked to invest, but they do not necessarily have an interest in it, and still they uh, will see it in their tariffs because the tariffs are not charged by individual pipes. They are set uh, by the regulator and the TSO on a whole system because we have an entry exit system in Europe. So that means that you charge for the entry and the exit and not for the kilom kilometer of pipe that you use. Means that investments in new pipelines are spread out over the uh, whole system. So the whole system uh, has to increase tariffs or the, there is a change in the costs. That means that some regulators, some countries, have less of an interest in building a pipe than others. In particular, if you are, as I said, at the end of a pipe, you want it. But if you are at the beginning, you are not necessarily eager to invest in it. Those things, of course, should be overcome. And we should look at who benefits and then also who pays. This is something we address also in the 10E regulation, and I'll get to that later. Uh, another thing is the question of competing infrastructure. When you are talking about big supply routes, for example, comparing uh, supply to Germany from Russia through the Ukraine, Slovakia and the Czech Republic compared to through Belarus and Poland or Nord Stream, they are all different ways to supply Germany. And in a way that means that these pipelines are to some extent competing with each other. And when it is a regulated system, we don't want to create a situation where regulators or TSOs are 
competing through regulation on what pipeline to use. This uh, should be pre present prevented and uh, this is a thing that we need to look into further as we go along because at the moment uh, regulators are free uh, to see how they set the tariffs but that can lead to undesired effects that need to be addressed. So, exemptions. As I said, the normal system is regulated tariffs, regulated third-party access, but there is also a possibility to ask for exemptions from those rules for new projects that are particularly risky that they would not be developed in a regulated system. For that, you have to meet certain criteria. First, the risk criterion, but also your project has to be beneficial to security of supply and competition, and you have to make sure that it does not distort the functioning of the internal market. Um, this, these criteria are uh, tested first by the national regulator and then by the commission because a project developer goes to the regulator to ask for an exemption, proving the case, uh, say how they meet the criteria, then the regulator decides they can impose conditions or they can give it to the commission and say we agree and then uh, what do you think and then the commission has to give its opinion and impose conditions or not or refuse it full stop, that's also possible of course. So what could possible conditions be that are uh, defined either at uh, national or at EU level? Uh, the added value of the Commission being involved is of course that it has to look beyond the borders and has to look at the impact on the wider European market. Um, so far, the uh, kind of conditions that we have imposed on projects where we have had requests for exemptions, which were for example 11 LNG terminals and four uh, gas pipeline projects, uh, the most uh, famous probably being Nabucco um, for the pipelines and when it comes to LNG terminals for example the gate terminal in Rotterdam or the Dunkirk terminal in France and also a few terminals in the UK. Um, so as I said what are the possible conditions that we would put on such an exemption request? First of all the um, exemption so the, the granted derogation from the normal rules has always uh, a limit in time depending on the rate of return, the payback uh, for the infrastructure, that usually determines more or less when the exemption ends and when it should be integrated into the normal regulated regime. And typically those periods are between 15 and 25 years. Um, <clears throat> then uh, what uh, we also require in particular when it comes to pipelines is that when the forward flow, so the main supply route is exempted, the reverse flow, the uh, net let's say the swapping, netting of the flows in the opposite direction is part of the regulated regime, as well as use it or lose it rules so that when the pipeline is not used by the original uh, holder of the capacity or the one who developed the project, it can be used by other parties. Um, then we have had a few cases like Nabucco and Opal where uh, we had doubts on the project actually benefiting competition because the dominant incumbent in those markets where the gas was supposed to end up were involved and um, then we uh, gave those projects the choice between either a capacity cap on the use of the pipe so limiting the amount of the capacity they could use in the pipeline that they want to build or alternatively if they want to use the whole pipe they have to release gas at the end let's say at the delivery point uh, so that means through auctions, for example, what we typically refer to as gas release programs. And uh, one other thing that is also a standard requirement in these projects is that an open season takes place so that before the project is being built, whether it's an LNG terminal, a pipeline or anything else, uh, the market interest in that capacity is tested. Um, then I have a few, two points here on the motivation, so uh, one I already mentioned which is the competition between different infrastructure projects, that could be a reason for exemptions, but another uh, could be that uh, it is the project developers who actually consider it too risky to develop it under a regulated regime, or alternatively uh, that it is the regulator who says that he does not want a project in his regulated asset base because he doesn't want the cost for that project to be socialized. <clears throat> then very quickly about gas storage because that is a particularly, uh, particular regime. We don't treat gas storage as we do pipelines or LNG uh, terminals because gas storage is one of the ways to provide flexibility in the market. Very 
often the only way or the only uh, economic way, but in principle you can also uh, provide flexibility through other measures. So the basic criterion here is, is that access to storage, to a storage capacity necessary to have access to the market to be able to compete? If so, then there is the choice between a regulated system, which is more like the pipelines, uh, meaning regulated tariffs and TPA, or negotiated uh, access, which means that the regulator just controls that the access terms are right, that it's non-discriminatory, but does not set the tariffs, so they should be market-based. And this is um, uh, justified by the fact that storages in different countries can compete with each other for the same flexibility. You can store it in one site or the other and transport it where you need it. Uh, people can build new storages if they want, if the geology is right, of course, so there are limits to how far you can compete and not, but that is very much left to the discretion of the member state who have to justify how they deal with storage and make that transparent, but they have the choice between the free market regulated or negotiated tariffs. What is important for all of those uh, storage facilities is that the use of the capacity is being made transparent so that you can't use the storage facility to hoard it and to block competitors. So then I want to shortly talk about the 10E regulation that I already mentioned before. This is something that uh, is adopted in principle but still needs to be formalized and that is about speeding up investment in European infrastructure. So this is a dedicated proposal to make sure that we invest in new infrastructure, not just gas, but also electricity and even oil and CO2 pipelines. But the focus being on electricity and gas because the networks are so essential for the creation of the European market. We also need to put everything in place so that it can be built. That is partially the regulated regime, the way the internal market operates, but we also talk about permit granting, and I will get to that later. Um, first of all, it sets the principle on how to come to identifying projects that have a European interest. So identify those projects that are so important for the creation of the European market. And here you see the scheme of how that is supposed to work. It starts with a 10-year network development plan of the uh, TSOs. It goes to the stakeholders, to project developers, uh, to regulators who have to check it and it ends up with the European Commission because in the end they have to approve the final list of projects of co common interest. Um, and in between there are regional groups where the different projects are discussed and being ranked. <clears throat> so for the permit granting, if you are a project of common interest then you have certain specific rights granted in this regulation for your project that should help you to speed up uh, building um, the infrastructure. And uh, that the main thing there is that you have to have one competent authority in a member state in place that makes sure that the, uh, uh, the permit is granted on time, that the procedure is done on time, and um, that on time means within three and a half years. So we have a European deadline on within which member states have to grant permits for projects that are identified of common interest. Or refuse, you can also of course refuse, but they have to deal with the procedure in three and a half years. All of this we don't want to do without uh, touching on the citizens' rights and uh, touching uh, on the basic uh, possibilities for people to say what is happening in their neighborhood and the, all the uh, procedures to be involved, etc., etc. So we want to make sure that this is done in full transparency because it's quite clear that we can uh, push things through once or twice, but uh, it does not work in the long term, and we don't want to do that either. We need the full citizens' involvement in the projects, and that requires that member states, regulators, and TSOs get their act together and communicate in a timely and transparent fashion to all the stakeholders and the citizens involved. Then we have uh, some articles in that regulation about the regulatory framework. One of them is about regulators who may not agree about uh, investing in a pipeline. If they, there is a principle set that the one who benefits also have to uh, pay for it. Um, and we do that through a European-wide cost-benefit analysis. Um, so we are developing a kind of reference methodology that uh, on the one hand will be used to identify which projects are important, but that can also then be used in case of disputes when 
parties do not agree whether or what the benefits are of a specific project. If regulators do not agree, then ACER can decide, so the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy. Regulators can become involved, but we hope that the threat or the backstop of them becoming involved is sufficient reason for regulators to solve it before it gets that far. Because remember, we are trying to speed it up. We're not trying to end up in endless procedures. Then, uh, last but not least, um, part of the speeding up of the infrastructure building also has to do with uh, money, and we have created a European fund, not just for energy infrastructure, but also for transport and ICT infrastructure called the European, uh, the Connecting Europe facility. Um, the Council, the European Council, has decided on uh, its uh, setup because we originally proposed 9.1 billion and the current, uh, let's say, tentative decision is to have 6 billion for energy infrastructure, um, which means that we have to be more critical than what we originally intended, that we have to combine more efforts with the EIB, uh, with the EBRD and other financial players in the market to make sure that we can deliver on the investments in infrastructure. But uh, with 6 billion, we can support the main key infrastructures that needs to be built in Europe and that will not be built without public money becoming involved. So this is about projects that have clear benefits but that are not necessarily paid for by the market. I was talking about um, physical reverse flow as a kind of insurance, for example, for Bulgaria if the Russian gas supply doesn't come. And uh, such insurances are normally not paid for by the market and therefore they could merit the in, uh, support from the Connecting Europe facility. This is actually the end of my presentation. I hope I have given you an overview of what is at stake when it comes to investing in European infrastructure. Regulation on the one hand, exemptions on the other hand, permit granting as a relevant aspect, and um, the third party access rules that are also relevant in this respect. We need on the one hand to optimize the existing infrastructure and facilitate building the new ones under the right conditions and uh, making sure that we allocate the costs and the benefits right. We are setting up the system that should be able to do this. There is a lot of work going on on network codes, for example, and I'm confident that by 2014, we will have made major steps forward to realize an internal energy market in the EU. Thank you very much for your attention.